hot breath. I mean, you know, for stand up, it was like I just looked at the game. I was like, okay, what do I need to do? First of all, I need to get undeniably funny. That's the first thing. How do I get undeniably funny? I get on stage as much as I can. So I was barking for a club, which means handing out tickets mm. to go to a club in exchange for stage time. So I was getting up tons of times a week in front of real audiences very early on in my in my career. You know, I was probably getting up five, seven times a week in front of real audiences early in my career. Unheard of. So I had an this advantage. in New York. So this is in New York. Yeah. Then uh, I stopped working at one of those clubs. I kind of got like fired from barking or one club closed. They didn't ask me to work at the other one. So I, uh, I basically, we found this other place that was around the block and they had shows there and um, they were just kind of like free shows asking people to come off the street. And I got involved in that club and I started working for one of the guys there and I, we were just kind of friendly and I was running his shows. I just found a place to get up consistently. And I started running a couple shows there with friends. We would just ask strangers from the streets to come in. And um, it was great because when you have your own show, you have your own show. Mm -hmm. A lot of times it might be repeat audience. Mm -hmm. So you can't work the same jokes out because it's the same audience. So it's good because you're practicing new jokes, but you're not getting good at anything. You know, it's like you're learning a new um, like pool shot every week. It's like you're not getting really better at pool. You just kind of get marginally better at these new jokes that you never really get to try. Mm. But we could work on the same jokes for months because it was a different group of people coming in every week. So we did that. Then I once I felt like I was undeniably funny, at least funny to the point where I feel like I could you know, be on stage with these other guys who were on stage. And how long in your career was that? A few years in, I mean, yeah. I mean, now I would look back and be like, oh, I was awful. But for the time I was able to go, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm good enough to be on the stage with these guys. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, why are they on the stage? So I started analyzing the people I saw at all the clubs. And it was like Sherrod Small, like James Smith and these kind of comics. And um, they were all on Best Week Ever. I noticed all the comics who are best week ever were performing at all the clubs, Christian Finnegan. And I was like, okay, I need to get on a show that is a weekly show that will give me some leverage. So now, cause it's not just about funny. It's like, if you're as funny as all the other guys, okay, you got to be funnier than them and have something. So I got on a uh, guy code and that was my weekly. Now I had some leverage. Now I could go to a club and be like, Hey, I'm on a TV show every week. Can I get on? Yeah. How do you how'd you get on Guy Code? I uh, make pitched, it sound so easy. Uh, yeah, it was it, it was it was kind of there was some you know one of the good things is like knowing what you want to do. Mm. So like I mm. I did a New Year's Eve show, like one of those countdown shows for MTV. So I got into the MTV door. They really liked me, so I um, had a meeting with them. I was pitching a show, which I ended up not really wanting to do, but at least like the person saw it. I was interesting. Uh, and then while pitching it, uh, she asked me like what my thing was. And I was just like, ah, I just, you know, I got a guy's perspective. I got an unapologetically male and, you know, this is how I feel. And I'd like to be the voice for, you know, for, uh, for men nowadays. And I feel like they don't really have a voice. And all of a sudden guy code came down the pipeline and she remembered that meeting. She's like, I'd like to suggest a guy. Now, had I never said what I truly want to do, maybe I would have never got that meeting. Right. Most people, I think put this wide umbrella, this wide net, but the net is so wide it never catches anything. Mm. You know what I'm saying? If you say specifically what you want to do to people, when a project comes up this specific, they'll think about you for it. If you're like, I just want to be on television, nobody's remembering the meeting where the guy goes, I just want to be on television and going, okay, I should put that. They will remember the meeting and say, listen, I love monster trucks. That's my shit. I'm a monster truck aficionado. If a monster truck show comes on, they can be like, I remember meeting this guy who's into monster trucks. You know what I'm saying? So mm -hmm. know what you want. And then when something comes down the line, people tag you for it. There was one time you were on five shows yeah. simultaneously. Yeah. I was a guy at MTV for a minute. So you understand the TV game and all that. Maybe you could provide some insight into maybe first off, even just how to pitch a show. What are they? Yeah. I mean, I didn't pitch any of them. You know, yeah. I was just, I just had a contract with MTV and they could put me on as many things as they wanted. And, um, there was a moment in, in history at MTV where I was the guy, you know, I hosted everything from a dating show to his jobs show. I was on 
guy code, girl code, jobs that don't suck. I hosted spring break. I hosted another, you know, festival. Like I was just, they would, they would just throw me on everything. Did the awards show in That's Europe. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I hosted the EMAs out there in Europe for like the American syndication of it. But it was, um, it was a cool time, man. I was just busy as fuck and bouncing around. They put me on everything. It was, it was definitely cool. Yeah. We're not on the same page anymore. Is that you just grew apart or did an event happened? Uh, I think an event sparked it, but also they, it was also some frustration on both of our parts. Um, you know, I, 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 hmm. I also think maybe like, uh, I don't want to blame my manager, but I think my manager made some poor decisions at the time. I'm no longer with him, but I think that led to a kind of aggravated relationship between the two of us. Mm. Like he, allowed me to do a show on a competing channel that I thought was okay to do, but it turns out it wasn't that kind of pissed off the MTV folks. But after we already had a little bit of a, you know, kind of tumultuous relationship, I, I didn't want to do any more corny shows. Gotcha. I had bad experiences with a couple of corny shows and I had realized I'm not really into that. I want to do these kind of fun, interesting shows. And, um, they also wanted to make a show kind of based on brilliant idiots and, I felt that that was our entity and our project. And they kind of felt like since they introduced me and Charlemagne that they owned it, not owned it, but like were entitled to it creatively mm -hmm. in some way. <laughs> and I was like, nah, fam, that's not what it is. <laughs> so that show ends up being Uncommon Sense. Hot breath. 